Welcome back to another Mosaic.org tutorial. Mosaic is just a platform for med students to learn medicine. If you're a med student, I really suggest to check it out. Today we're going to be talking about the carotid triangle. And if there's one thing to say about it in overview, uh, it's that the carotid vessels pass through. That's the most important thing, um, and basically that's the basis um, for which all of the other structures um, in the triangle are related. So we're going to talk first about the borders uh, of the triangle, and then we're going to talk about the contents. So not unlike other triangles in the neck, the one of the borders is sternocleidomastoid. Sternocleidomastoid in the carotid triangle is uh, forming the lateral border, and then two muscles which both assert, insert onto the hyoid bone um, are forming the inferior medial and the superior medial borders. So the inferior medial border is the omohyoid muscle, and the superior medial border is the posterior belly of digastric. And the triangle extends all the way up to the mastoid, uh, which is where these muscles are attaching. Um, and that's, that's kind of around C1. Uh, and then it extends as inferiorly as C5. So um, the triangle does span a fair considerable distance. And now we're going to talk about um, the roof and the floor of the triangle. So when you gaze, <coughs> when you... I don't know if gaze is the right word, but when you look uh, in the triangle, when you're looking down into the floor of the triangle, <coughs> what you're essentially looking at uh, is, the is the pharynx and the larynx. Um, and the floor of the triangle is constructed from the muscles that surround those viscera. And they are the inferior constrictor in the more inferior aspect, and then the middle constrictor uh, just a little bit higher. And there's a very tiny gap between them, and that gap is filled basically by the thyrohyoid membrane, and some people might argue that the thyrohyoid muscle should also be included here. But uh, really, you don't actually see those muscles because they're covered by viscera. So what you look at um, is you look down onto the pretracheal fascia, which are covering those structures. <coughs> now, what's forming the, what's forming the roof um, is surprisingly little. It's actually unbelievable that there's so little protection for the carotid vessels. There's a little bit of skin, a little bit of platysma, and then there's a layer of investing fascia. Uh, now, investing fascia is, is it's considered a layer of deep fascia, uh, but it's the most superficial of the deep fascia. It basically runs around the entire neck, and it's called investing fascia because it invests uh, the sternocleidomastoid and it invests uh, the trapezius. So the fascia is here investing sternocleidomastoid, um, and that is the... Uh, basically the structure that directly forms the roof. But it's unbelievable that there's so little covering covering the carotid vessels. So now when we focus on the contents, there's a lot of stuff. But I want to give you a way of conceptualizing it, which is first just to think about the carotid sheath and the carotid vessels. So almost all of the structures in this triangle are somehow related to... Uh, the contents of the carotid sheath. So at, at its inferior most margin as it enters the triangle, kind of around C5, the contents of the carotid sheath are the common carotid, so it hasn't bifurcated yet, the vagus nerve, uh, which is sitting most posteriorly, that's it, posteriorly, this is the anterior direction, and the internal jugular vein. And as we'll see, all of the other things that are Basically, all of the other things that are inside the triangle, except for a couple of nerves, are somehow branches of this uh, common carotid artery, or, or moreover, branches um, of the external carotid artery after the bifurcation. Uh, and if they're not that, then they're tributaries for the internal jugular vein. But basically, everything in the triangle is somehow related to the common carotid artery uh, and the internal jugular vein. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add the vessels, and there's going to be a lot of stuff, but we're just going to talk through it, and I'm going to show you how they're all related. So what you've got um, just here, this little bulge, uh, is, is the carotid bulb, um, the carotid sinus, uh, and this uh, always occurs at the level of the bifurcation. And, and at the bifurcation, what you have is you have more anteriorly and slightly more medially, actually, you have the external carotid. And all of the branches come off the external carotid. The internal carotid isn't actually sitting more internally, as you'd suspect. It kind of courses up and does that later. Uh, 
So when it bifurcates, it's actually sitting more externally, which doesn't make sense because it's the internal carotid, but it is sitting more externally as it bifurcates, and it has no branches uh, through this triangle or indeed no, no branches to the face um, or to any of these surrounding viscera. They all come off the external carotid triangle, which slightly confusingly is sitting more medially, more internally um, at this point. So when we look at all of the branches of uh, the carotid, the external carotid, uh, which, which, and I've drawn it in here, that bifurcation is happening around about C4. When you look at those branches, some people like to use mnemonics. Um, so they say like, some anatomists like fucking, others prefer stimulation, manual, prefer manual stimulation. Um, that is the named, the, that, so the first letter of each of those words is for the named branches. But I actually think it makes a lot of sense if you, just think about um, what the main viscera are uh, and then think about the fact that you need blood supply to those viscera. So the very first branch coming off um, the coming off the external carotid just as it basically just as it bifurcates is a branch that's going to the thyroid. So the thyroid obviously needs a good blood supply uh, and that branch is the superior thyroid artery um, because there's an inferior thyroid artery coming up from the uh, coming up from the thyrocervical trunk. Um, so the first branch goes, comes off right at the bifurcation and that is the superior thyroid artery a and that branch is coming off the anterior aspect and the next branch that comes off, um, the, sorry, the next branch that comes off the anterior aspect is going to the tongue. So you can imagine that the tongue needs a very rich, no, uh, rich arterial supply as well. Um, as you know, rich arterial and rich nervous supplies seem to go together. And so the next anterior facing branch that comes off is the lingual artery, you know, going to the tongue. Uh, and then finally, uh, obviously you need a good blood supply to the face. So there's the facial artery. So um, some people like to use that mnemonic. Um, some anatomists like fucking, others prefer manual stimulation. It's like quite an old mnemonic. But I think it makes a lot of sense just to look at the anterior branches and think, Okay, so one goes to the thyroid, the superior thyroid, one goes to the tongue, the, the lingual, and one goes to the face, the, the facial. Um, you know, they kind of, they kind of make sense that they would need to be supplied anteriorly. And then the other low branch that you can see here, I've kind of made it a little bit more tra transparent to kind of indicate that it's deeper. This branch is going medially, and what it's, what it's doing is it's basically ascending up um, uh, next, to, next, to the, next to the pharynx. So it's the ascending pharyngeal. Um, so that's like quite self-explanatory as well. Now there's only one there's only one artery which is going backwards here or going posteriorly, uh, and that's basically coursing along the inferior margin of the posterior digastric, and that's the occipital. And the way I remember that is that I kind of remember that the face is at the front and the occiput is at the back, and it literally comes off at the same level as the facial artery. So the facial artery is going to the face. Uh, and at exactly the same level, the occipital artery comes off and it's, it's going to the occiput. Um, so they're the five arteries. Uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's that hard. Just to recap, superior thyroid uh, is the first anterior branch, lingual is the second anterior branch, and then facial is the third anterior branch. And at the level that the facial comes off, the occipital comes off in the opposite direction. Uh, and then there's a branch that runs up along the pharynx. So that's the ascending pharyngeal. So that's that's all of the branches of the external common carotid. And because the internal common carotid doesn't have any branches in the triangle, that's, that's all of the branches, uh, that's all of the arterial branches in this triangle. So uh, the nice thing about the veins is that basically there's only ever a vein uh, when there is an arterial branch. So this, uh, this tributary here of the internal jugular vein, that is the superior thyroid vein. Uh, and this tributary here is the ascending pharyngeal vein. And this tributary here is just the tributary from the lingual vein. And this one here is the one that corresponds with, with uh, the facial artery. This is the facial vein. So um, the only thing to... And, and this here, of course, is the occipital vein. So basically, all of the tributaries of the internal jugular vein are just relating to arteries that, by and large, ha by and large have exactly the same name. There's only one that has a slightly different name, 
uh, and that's that the for the facial artery there's the common facial vein and the re I, I put these other two tributaries of that here because this is actually the facial artery uh, and the facial artery joins with the retro uh, the retromandibular artery um, and they then form the common facial vein so but all of the other veins have exactly the same names as the arteries um, and all of the arteries you can either remember the mnemonic some anatomists like fucking, others prefer manual stimulation, or you can just remember that they're kind of very logical uh, in the way that they've been named. So that is all of the the kind of arteriovenous stuff. Uh, now let's now let's look at the nerves. So I'm going to get them all here. These are these are all of. Now we've got all of the nerves. I'm just going to take that one away. Um, but basically, uh, so if if so far you just remember that there are things things that are related to the carotid sheath which makes sense because it's the carotid the only other two things that you need to do is remember that uh, nerves from 12, 11 and branches of 10 so the final three cranial nerves are coursing down through the triangle and what you can remember is that um, one of them is anterior one of them is medial and one of them is lateral so the one that is lateral, you can see it here is a spinal accessory. It's basically just cutting through the apex um, on its way down into the posterior triangle um, uh, where it's very important uh, and because it goes on to supply the trapezius. And this picture doesn't demonstrate it very well, but it's actually passing through sternocleidomastoid, not over the top, not behind it, passing through it because it innovates sternocleidomastoid. So that's 11. Uh, and now here's 12. So 12 is the nerve which is passing uh, anteriorly to the plexus, it's, it's, sorry, to the carotid sheath. It's actually sitting, um, sitting in front of it. And what's interesting about this is that the hypoglossal nerve actually descends down along the carotid sheath until it gets to the occipital artery. And when it gets to the occipital artery, it wraps itself around it um, and obviously changes its direction. Um, and then it burrows in under the intermediate tendon of the digastric, um, but it, but when whenever you are kind of looking at dissections or looking at anatomy, if you can find the occipital artery, there's a very good chance that you'll be able to see the hypoglossal nerve wrapping around it. So we've talked about 11, we've talked about 12, and you might kind of be wondering what these little guys running down here are. Well, they're branches uh, of the vagus. That there is the superior laryngeal nerve, and the superior laryngeal nerve has branched very high up uh, from the vagus, um, and it has been coursing down the medial aspect, because remember it's related to the larynx, so just like the ascending pharyngeal is on the medial aspect, that's an artery, the superior laryngeal nerve is also on the medial aspect, because they're both related to those midline viscera, so it has coursed down medially uh, to enter the triangle, and at about the the level that the lingual artery comes off the external carotid, that's about the same level that the superior laryngeal bifurcates um, into an internal branch and into an external branch. And the reason that I put this little dotted line here is because the internal laryngeal artery is very closely related with a branch from the superior thyroid. And that branch is the superior laryngeal artery. So they actually both go through a structure right here. They both go through uh, the thyrohyoid cartilage, or the, sorry, the thyrohyoid membrane. So the internal laryngeal immediately goes internal after it bifurcates, and this internal laryngeal nerve does so by passing in with the superior laryngeal artery. The two go together. And not dissimilarly, I suppose, I suppose the, the external laryngeal nerve keeps coming down as well. But, and the external laryngeal nerve is very closely related um, with the, the branches of the superior thyroid artery itself. Uh, and often, um, when they're doing thyroid surgery, they, they have to be very careful that they don't ligate the superior thyroid artery uh, at right, right as it enters right as it enters the thyroid, because if you try and ligate it right as it enters the thyroid, the external laryngeal nerve is almost always crossing it there. 
So what they do is they try and ligate it a little bit higher up, uh, and that, that means that there's a lesser chance that the nerve is sitting so close to it, because the nerve definitely crosses the superior thyroid just as it's about to enter the thyroid gland. So they are the branches of, of 10, they're branches of the vagus. So immediately there's branches of 10, of the vagus, um, anteriorly, anteriorly, there's the hypoglossal, there's 12, wrapping around the occipital, and then there's also the spinal accessory, number 11, going through the kind of apex on its way down to the posterior triangle. And we shouldn't forget that the vagus itself is coursing uh, in the carotid sheath, just behind the other two structures. Okay, so now we're moving on to this little guy who I put here in orange, um, and it's got a very strange kind of pattern to it, doesn't it? It kind of doesn't really seem to make sense. Uh, what we're looking at here is the ansa cervicalis. So if you're not sure what the answer is, it's ansa cervicalis. And what it is, is it's, it's a loop, as you can see, that is formed from two roots, one coming down kind of over, uh, over the arteries and one coming down over the veins. And where they are coming from is from the cervical plexus. They are coming from the cervical plexus. Now, this root, which is the inferior root, is made up of contributions from the fibers of C2 and C3. And it kind of looks like it's just appearing out of midair because what it's doing at this point is piercing the prevertebral fascia and it's coming up into the triangle here. So that inferior root uh, of the ansa cervicalis is from C2 and 3 fibers. And this is the superior root here, this part here. And the superior root comes from the C1 fibers, so it comes from C1, and the C1 fibers course down, and at the point that the hypoglossal nerve is wrapping around the occipital artery, they jump on. And they jump on, and a few of them continue along its course, but the rest of them quickly get off and come down to form the superior root of the ansa cervicalis. And you can see that the two form this loop here, and it's the loop itself and kind of the, the roots that are referred to as the ansa cervicalis. And what they do is they just supply the muscles uh, of, the, of the hyoid region, of the infrahyoid region. So um, that is the only other final nerve that I wanted you to see that's sitting anteriorly. And although you won't be able to see it behind here, just for the sake of completion, I've included it here. There is, there is something that's sitting posteriorly to these structures. It's a bunch of nerves. Uh, and that is the cervical trunk, the sympathetic cervical trunk. But that is basically all of the nerves and arteries and veins that make up the content um, of this triangle. And I know that there's a lot of them, but to try and conceptualize them for yourself, just think that there are things associated with the carotid sheath, meaning there's the bifurcation, the two vessels that arise, and then all of the arteries come off that vessel, and all of the veins correspond with those arteries. And then there are three nerves, 12, 11, and branches of 10, bearing in mind that 10 itself is actually in the carotid sheath. And then there are these two other random things, one that's sitting in front, and one that's sitting behind the vessels. One of them is the ansa cervicalis, and the other is the cervical trunk. And that's it, that's the carotid sheath. There's uh, written instructions for this and examples for this up at mosaic.org. Cheers.